very glad to have everyone here for this uh, this installment of Welcome Change, which is Ashoka's conversation series about what's working and what's next. Um, I'm really excited about today's conversation, which is about masculinity and fatherhood. Uh, as a father myself, uh, and as someone who has concerns about our conceptions of masculinity and manhood in America in particular, it's a topic that's, that's of great interest to me, um, and I'm sure to lots of you joining. We have two wonderful fellows with us today. Gary Barker uh, is the co-founder of Promundo, uh, a leading global organization that advances gender equality and prevents violence by engaging men and boys to shift harmful gender norms. He's also spearheaded several global initiatives like Men Care that works across 50 countries to promote men's involvement in caregiving. Uh, and he created the International Men and Gender Equality Survey that examines men's attitudes towards violence, gender equity, fatherhood, and more. And we have Charles Daniels Jr., founder of Fathers Uplift, which among other things, created this country's first mental health and substance abuse treatment facility specifically for fathers and families. And that more broadly helps fathers overcome barriers that prevent them from remaining engaged in their children's lives. I'm Michael Zakaris, I'm director of Ashoka's programs in the US. Uh, as always, we'll speak with our fellows for about 20, 25 minutes and then uh, we'll open things up for questions for those listening. If you, if you have a question at any time, you can submit it via the Q&A button below. I will also share a recording of the conversation in the next few days. Finally, I want to acknowledge this conversation is supported by Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the first in a series, in fact, and part of some collaborative work we're doing together to identify and share insights and patterns related to gender equity from across our global fellowship. So let's jump right in. And Charles, I'd love to start with you. Um, you remind us that uh, approximately 10 million kids in the U.S., are growing up without a relationship with their fathers, which is strongly correlated with a range of, of lifelong adversities from poverty to school performance, to social and emotional problems. And yet you're saying our social services sector is really failing to engage fathers in meaningful ways. Tell us how and, and why that's the case. Well, that's a great question. You know, we're still trying to figure out how did we end up in this situation? Um, how is it when my wife and I are having children, there's a doctor designated to support my wife, there's a doula, right, there's nurses that's designated to understand her process thoroughly, but there's no one really designated to understand my process as a father, the mental health experience that I'm currently engaging in as I transition into fatherhood. Why is it that many of our students in public health programs, social work schools, psychology schools, are not really receiving specific curricular on how to engage fathers and their families, how to understand a father's process and what he thinks about fatherhood, even his specific demographics in his communities, right? This system essentially does not prepare practitioners on how to engage fathers effectively, right? When you look at insurance reimbursement sheets, we are a mental health and substance use uh, treatment facility that receives insurance reimbursement. There aren't specific criteria for reimbursement for working with fathers specifically, right? So we have to find ways in which we can lump fatherhood under other service modalities, right? This is a major problem in the United States. And there's one that we are paying close attention to by preparing practitioners on how to work with men, particularly men of color who are fathers, right? By making sure that we provide clinical structured guidance to support fathers who are transitioning into fatherhood, but also other dynamics of fatherhood. Like, I'm pretty sure you've been a father yourself. You know, for instance, when you held your child for the first time, you did not imagine living a life without them. We assume that millions of fathers, when they hold their child for the first time, do not imagine being separated from their kids. So really preparing practitioners to work with fathers who have been disengaged from their children, who are experiencing trauma every day that goes by that they don't see their kids. This is a big problem and we are in existence to make sure that we address that issue, but it is huge. Mm. And, and Charles, it's not just that uh, most services aren't targeted towards men and fathers, but even when they are, they're often misdirected, right? You make the distinction, for example, between anger management versus sadness management. And I, I'm curious, tell us more about that and, and, and what, what that reveals and why that distinction is important. Well, you know, I think, you know, it goes down to society's expectation in America, what men should be doing and what they're not doing. And these assumptions that when men are, are angry, you know, justifiably so from not being able to see their kids, they're not just horrible people 
with records who don't care nothing about society. There's more to their pain and there's more to their story. But what we realize that oftentimes we get caught up in judging men prematurely, right? So we really understand that there's more to a father's ability, his emotions to be in tune with what is going on. I think another example is we don't emphasize there's millions of parenting programs. And as you said, there's millions of clinicians and there's millions of facilities. But what makes us different isn't the service we provide, it's how we make our fathers feel, right? When we ask our dads, what is it that makes us different? They say, you know what, Charles, we can go to other therapists, we can go to other agencies and receive services, but you make us feel valued and important. And we don't have to have a white picket fence with a house or be able to provide everything for our kids. We can come to you as we are and not feel judged, not feel ostracized, not feel that we're less than because we make mistakes. So we're countering this whole notion of what it means to be a man in America, but also how to treat men in America, not based on what they've achieved or what they've accomplished in their life, but based on the fact that they're human and they deserve to be loved and appreciated. We also believe in not teaching men how to parent their children, but mainly focusing on how do they parent themselves. That's important to us. You know, it's important for you to learn how to love yourself. You know, we're taught how to be strong all the time, how not to show any emotion. But we want to let you know that emotions are beautiful. When you're not feeling emotions, you're not living. How do you embrace sadness the same way that you embrace anger and happiness? How do you understand that you're human because you can feel? You're not less than a man because you can't feel. And for us, that, those are important lessons. And that's a central goal of, of, of your work and of Father's Uplift is, is, to, is, is to help fathers be emotionally present uh in their lives in general but certainly with their kids even if they're physically absent absolutely absolutely you know that's the ultimate goal you know we want to make sure that you can love yourself despite your capacity to be able to buy your kids a house or lack thereof right we want to make sure that you know that if you are capable of loving yourself and make and making sure that you're appreciated despite your own mistakes you will automatically show up and be a parent for your child because you understand that imperfection is a part of beauty. It's part of being human. Many men that walk through our doors who are bombarded by all of these expectations of what society places on them, they don't believe that, right? They believe they have to do, they have to do these conditions. They have to meet these certain obligations to be man enough, to be even adequate enough to be in their kids' lives. We've had men tell us when they first entered our program, maybe my child is better off without me. Because I can't get to my house or I can't buy them toys or I can't, I don't have a nice job, right? That I can show that I'm making enough money. Maybe my kids are better off without me. And we don't believe that, right? So we are essentially fighting what society's view of men is by making sure that men learn how to love themselves and disregard what society is saying to find the type of man that you want to be and be that. Mm. Thank you. Gary, I'll turn to you now. It's so much of your work around the world has been around cultivating healthier masculinities and engaging men more fully in the movement towards gender equity, uh, but also in caregiving and, and, and child rearing. Uh, and so since we just heard from Charles, I think it'd be helpful to start there. From, from your perspective, why, why is fatherhood and male involvement in caregiving important from a gender equity standpoint? Yeah. Um, excellent question, and yeah, inspiring to hear, hear about Charles' work. And I think you know we got a, got a lot of points and operating principles in common. Um, our you know our approach as an organization and our name um, alludes to the fact that we think gender equality is a good for the world. That um, being healthier, connected, equitable men, we're better to ourselves, we're better to our partners, we're better to our children, and the world is a better place. Um, and within that, you know, I think it's been, um, and I agree with all that Charles said about kind of the, the invisibility of men's caregiving, whether we look, you know, in most kind of gender equality initiatives, it's a lot of discussion about the care inequality as being perhaps the single largest driver of women's inequality in the world. And yet mm -hmm. we've lacked the imagination to say men can do our part. And in fact, if we look closely, a lot of men are doing most of their part. Um, how do we make that happen? So what we've been trying to do is to say, how do we look upstream to make it possible that men can be the involved caregivers that they want to be? And I think like Charles's work, we start with the assumption that most men um, do want to be caring, connected, support their children, 
um, be involved in the daily hands-on care work that being a parent and, uh, and multiple kinds of caregivers, not just biological fathers want to be. Um, so our, you know, whether, whether it's our research projects or connecting with others, we start with this premise. Men's caregiving is good for gender equality. It's good for women's economic and political empowerment. It's good for children. It's good for men themselves. Men who report close connected relationships with their children report that they have better health. Their mental health is better. Um, they're less likely to get involved in certain harmful practices or behaviors. So our question has been, how do we take that, that affirmation upstream? What are the things we need to change to make it possible? How do we raise boys early on to see ourselves as caregivers? That we, of course, want to be good in whatever cause we choose for our work, but we also need to know how to be caregivers. We need to look at parental leave policies. The U.S., of course, is you know the holdout globally of, of wealthy countries that has no federally mandated leave. We think we're getting close, but still have not been able to pass it. We do a lot of advocacy around that. Leave that offers equal days for dads. Um, we work on trying to build this into poverty alleviation programs. Um, so many of our programs, whether in the U.S. or elsewhere, sort of treat it that men really could care less about their households and their families, but we believe they need to be part of um, mm -hmm. social protection policies. Changing the, the service infrastructure the same way that Charles talked about. Um, we've done a lot of work in Brazil, Rwanda, and elsewhere of building into the public health system in countries that have a, a single payer system, as we call it in the U.S., um, building online training, building other campaigns within the health system to make it obvious that we engage men in care work from prenatal visits um, onward. And then um, how do we change the narratives about it? You mentioned Robert Woods Johnson is a supporter of this. We're working with support from them at the moment on a study on how fathers are portrayed in U.S. television, um, mm -hmm. and particularly looking at, you know, kind of the racism that's often present, uh, the myths about, you know, the so-called deadbeat dad, to change those stories, to look at what's, you know, kind of how we're producing some harmful messages there and how we can produce some healthier ones. Um, and then a lot of work, as I mentioned before, with boys. How do we start early on this? Um, so that all the things that Charles, Charles just mentioned about healthy masculinity, um, how can we start that conversation earlier, that boys learn how to express vulnerabilities, um, emotions in healthier ways, that you know, our, our, our emotional vocabulary is not restricted to being, um, to being angry or ecstatic, <laughs> that we have lots of other emotions in between. And, and right, so much of our, we were speaking about this a couple weeks ago, so much gender equity work is focused on how we raise our daughters. And Gary, mm -hmm. you and I are both raising daughters ourselves, but, but this qu central question of how we should raise boys is, is really, is, 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 is I think getting more attention and deservedly so. Peggy Ornstein, who wrote the book, Boys and Sex, uh, and that terrific Atlantic article, uh, The Miseducation of the American Boy, uh, she, she writes about how the definition of masculinity seems to be contracting. And I think, mm -hmm out of about 2000 young men that they asked, uh, what traits do society value in you most? Just 2% said honesty or morality. So, so I'm curious, Gary, how, how do you define healthy masculinity? And, and is it synonymous with a more expansive masculinity? It definitely is, and you know, yeah, and Peggy's work has, you know, inspired a lot of us, and just her, her compassionate listening to boys about the challenges, I think is what we need, definitely need more of. You know, when we when we strip away the you know the kind of questionnaires and and the and the rest and listen to boys and you know listen to boys, I think the majority of them. And we actually did a some listening with boys on the East Coast and West Coast just before from different political um, settings, just before COVID, and found when we asked them what it meant to be a boy, boys between the ages of eight and thirteen, or what it meant to be a man, the words were overwhelmingly positive, um, of being honest and helpful and caring and supportive, you know, the, the word cloud that we made out of it was a, was a hopeful place. Now then what we have to look at is this world that where I think definitions of masculinity, both in the US and my second home country of Brazil are being weaponized, particularly by the far right, being used to, to whip up political anger, driving, you know, an attack on our capital in the US, um, being used by some politicians to, you know, Josh Hawley in a recent statement of, you know, that we on that the progressives are trying to attack American American white manhood is the word that he left out in there, and I think we do have to stake out and say that is not the version of manhood that most boys of all backgrounds want to be part of. 
Um, I think we're repressing the innate goodness <laughs> of our sons by not pushing back against that argument. Um, and I think we need to do more, more in that space. Um, so yeah, they, these are challenging times to have these conversations around healthy masculinity because a lot of, a lot of um, conservative voices are pushing back on them. Um, but I think we have to make it safer for boys to be their caring, connected selves. Yeah, that was going to be my next question was about acknowledging this sort of backlash moment that we're that we're living through, you know, in this country and elsewhere. And that 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 sort of toxic masculinity that's feeding, uh, uh, you know, I think you could call it a politics of anger. And, and we yeah. often think of sort of angry white men in particular. So it's probably it's certainly not the first time there's been a backlash. But I'm curious from your standpoint, Gary, and you as well, Charles, like what 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 should we be like? How should we be coping with this? What what are the ways to uh, overcome that um, and 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 get past it? Charles, do you wanna do you wanna start? Sure. So, could you clarify the question again, Michael? Just want to make sure that I'm answering. Yeah, just just this moment we're living in, where where there, there's a real you know backlash on on you know an anti-feminist backlash, a, a, a you know the, the rise of the alt right, and as Gary was saying, this kind of weaponization of a certain kind of masculinity. And I'm just I'm curious, sort of what you know whether how that might be showing up in your own work, Charles. But from 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 both of you, sort of what what ideas you have for for how to cope and get past that. <clears throat> You know, it's interesting because our population, which are majority black men, they're coping with trying to stay alive and not die because of the color of their skin. You know, so, you know, worried about, you know, masculinity and what that looks like is secondary to um, their focus on trying to stay alive, but also navigate racism, but also understand that their value uh, about being a black and being a black man is, is important. I have one young man because we do talk about managing our emotions with our young men in our program who are growing up in households without their fathers. They learn about other emotions like sadness and anxiety and what does that look like, right? And how to cope with that. But I had one young man say, Charles, you know, every kid in my school has a police story as a black boy, right? I've also had a young eight year old African American male tell me that his skin isn't a curse, but at times he feels like it is. So when we think about, you know, these conversations and what is at the forefront of many of the black men that we serve mind is race and how to navigate um, the systems as a black father, how to understand that when you come into our clinic, you know, and you are trying to work on yourself, you may be stopped by the police. What do you do when you stop by the police? So that is the priority for our men. And I think masculinity is secondary. And I would say they're all lumped into one. Not only are they dealing with what does it look like to be a man? You know, how do I feel about people's views of me as a man? It's more so, how do I feel about being Black in America? And, and do I have enough confidence to call the police? Or, it, or am I ending my life when I call the police? What happens when I am stopped by the police? So these are the type of conversations that we're having. In addition to being a better father, being a great father, talking about emotions, we're trying to survive as Black men. So that's what we deal with a lot at our clinic. Charles, thanks for sharing that. And I, you know, I was, I was thinking about the um, one of the young men, an African American young man who's been one of our peer promoters at a some of our educational work with a curriculum called Manhood 2.0 here in D.C. And he, you know, I think he said it far more articulately than I have. He said, you know, harmful masculinity for um, for white men is like a flu, um, but if you're a man of color, it's like a full blown pneumonia um, of just that that it compounds in there. You know, of kind of how we how we restrict how we present ourselves, how our default emotion may be anger, and I think really that that look of understanding how, particularly for men of color, harmful ideas about masculinities are another layer of challenges, risks, and vulnerabilities. And I, you know, I've been trying to um, engage with colleagues at this moment in the U.S. to say, what do we do to call out angry white male supremacy? What does it look like? And I, you know, so much of our discourse and my own reaction looking, say, at January 6th or looking at um, po white police violence on black bodies has been to say that's not who we are um, and, and to want to step into that space of saying that's not me. And that's kind of the easy one, right, to say, well, you know, I'm white. I don't do those things. That's not me. I'm male. I'm white male. I don't do those things. But I think the hard part and what I'm 
what we're trying to do with some of our research is to step into that room and say, we have to be here and say, this is who too many people in our country are. Um, and what is it that is driving that anger? What is it that is letting large segments of our population get, uh, get away with such harm? What is accountability? And how do we call um, even the angriest white men into a conversation that says, you are better than this? Um, mm. And I, I think part of what we're trying to figure out is what is the right language for that calling in? Um, I, a colleague and I have just done two focus groups with one group of white male Trump voters and one group of diverse men, diverse ethnic backgrounds on the progressive side. We didn't bring up the issue of politics. We asked them both just kind of who loves you and who do you love? How have you been during COVID, particularly on your work trajectories? And as you talked about, you know, kind of troubles you've had in your life, how do you find redemption? How do you find support and hope? The travails were virtually the same with their differences, of course, but a lot of stuff around, you know, life challenges that any of us have in life, obviously with huge differences based on class and um, in life situations. They were kind of going on similar trajectories until the, the group of white men, one of whom had a MAGA cap on, said, well, everybody blames white men. We are now to be blamed for everything. And immediately this defensiveness went up and the conversation turned angry white supremacist politics in a heartbeat. And it just tells us how much, how do we capture that piece of humanity in the men, even the white men there who had similar concerns about how to be, show up as good parents, how to be good partners, how to atone for harms that they have caused and keep them from stepping into that space of anger, defensiveness, white supremacy. I don't know the answer, and I don't think there's any easy one, but I think you know what one of the things that we're trying to do is to say there's a lot of folks calling them into harm. We can list from Fox News to Jordan Peterson to dot 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 the number of websites that are calling men into into causing harm. We've got to step up and figure out what are the spaces that we can call in and offer um, and push for healthier connected masculinities. Um, I don't know the answer to that one, but I you know I I think that's what we're being called to say. How do we how do we go upstream so that all the examples that you gave, Charles, of institutionalized racism that happen on a daily basis, how do we go upstream to prevent those? Um, and, and, that, and that's a point that, you know, just to emphasize, and you've talked about this quite a bit, Gary, this, this difference of going, going from telling men what not to do, which is obviously important, to what they should be doing, right? Or as you're just putting it, from calling men out, which was this important role that the Me Too movement played, uh, to calling them in and 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 sort of facilitating that shift and 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 bringing them into the fold to support gender equity and healthier you know masculinity um, and it sounds like you know these kinds of conversations you've been having are are a step in 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 that direction at least mm -hmm. um, Charles um, I want to come back to you on on one thing that both you and and Gary raise frequently is how masculinity is tied up with or at least our often concurrent conceptions of masculinity in, in the US, but elsewhere is tied up with this unwillingness to ask for help, right? This inability to be vulnerable. And I'm curious how you cope with that since after all, helping fathers is, is so central to your work. Well, you know, that's one of the biggest things at Fathers Uplift that we have to contend with, right? Um, the good thing is, is that we have a population where a specific focus is a niche, right? If men are coming to our agency, they are focused on their kids, right? We get referrals. We have a waiting list. It's very focused, right? But that men can be guarded, right? There can be areas in their life where they want help. And, and then there's other areas where they know they need help and they may not want to entertain that. And what we find is that most of those, most of those areas that they don't want to entertain or receive help in, is connected to their past trauma, deep emotional hurt, right? Not knowing how to work on it. But what we hear, being afraid that if they open that wound, they don't know how to close it, right? So, you know, we find ourselves really emphasizing with men in particular and dealing with this whole notion of masculinity and relationships. We find it's important to have quality, deep-rooted relationships that are sustainable, right? At Father's Uplift, given that we work with men and families, we do not believe in discharging people right? 
We believe that mental health care support around fatherhood should be offered just as you would go to the doctor anytime that you would need support. This community clinic that's offered on an ongoing basis. Because many of our men, they ask for help in doses and they may not, they may get the help they need and detach, but if they know that they can always come back to a place to receive help, they will come back and perhaps get that deep rooted help that they need. And we realize there's a process. So as a practitioner, what we tell our team members, don't rush a man to change or open up with you. Follow his process, right? He will one day realize that if he needs help, he knows where he can go to. And for us, it's all about trust building, especially with Black men. Over the last three years, we had a 4% re recidivism rate with our men returning home from incarceration. They're out in the community with their children. They have not returned back to jail, and they're happy, and they're vulnerable. And they've learned how to embrace all of their emotions. The secret sauce is community here, sustainable mm -hmm. community. They know that when they call us, we will answer the phone anytime they are in need, that they are in need. And I they say that's how we deal with it. We don't rush it. We understand that this is a process, but we try to show up like their family would show up. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll go to a question from, from someone listening, from Scott, um, who uh, who says he feels like masculinity is something that he's inherited rather than something that he's been deliberate about building. Um, and so he's wondering, how does a man begin uh, or, or build on this inherited view of what healthy masculinity looks like? Yeah, good question. I'm, I'll, I'll jump in, Charles, and then I'd love your take on this as well. You know, one of the things we do, we have a, a, a father... Um, training approach that we that we partner in about 15 countries and carrying out, um, which is together with a female partner if they both want to participate in it. And uh, the first activity we do with fathers is a, is a letter to their own father or to another male caregiver in their life. And a lot of us who do father training activities often start with that, to just start with a bit of a reflection on what did I learn about fatherhood and manhood? How do I, how can I become more aware of those things? And I think the question asked is the first step um, so that we begin to, to be aware of it. Um, the, a lot of Promundo's work in Brazil was born out of some of Paulo Freire's traditions of how do, we, how do we achieve a collective consciousness? And I think another piece there is not just that, you know, I'm looking at it for myself, but also how do I look at, look at it with other men and women, other young men and young women in the same space so that together we can do it as a journey. I think one piece that we try to do is to say, you don't have to do it alone. And Charles, I think that I hear that as the essence of what you do in your programming is so much of what we hear as men is that we have to go it alone, even fixing our own manhood. And I think what we try to do so much is to say, you know, don't operate that machinery by yourself. <laughs> um, engage some others who have been down that journey, who can support you in it, who will figure out, you know, where you'll falter and how to um, how to get better at it. So, um, yeah, Charles, let me hand that over to you. Yeah, we use a we utilize a candy shop approach with our men, right? Yeah. I think about it, you take your kid to the candy shop and they see a different versions of candy that they want, and then they see candy that they don't want, right? <laughs> so we use that method when we meet with our men. So when you think about your life, you go into this candy shop of manhood, masculinity, fatherhood. What are some things that you learned that you like? What are some things that you learned that you did not like? And what is it that if you, if you can combine, combine both, what type of man do you want to be based on the things that you like and you don't like? And we start from scratch, right? We try to rule out everything that you have, that you thought you, a man needs to be, understand that first, but also the man that you want to be. And we get very real with that because for us, it's foundational. And until you commit to the man that you want to be with the characteristics that you think that man ought to have, Taking into consideration the characteristics that you were taught about being a man does not have to be the man that you need to be or that you want to be. So we encourage men to take ownership on that definition of what a man is. The same way that we encourage them to take ownership of that definition of what a black man is, right? You know, rule out what you don't like, take what you like, and commit to what you like. And realizing that everybody may not be happy about the type of man that you decide to be, but at the end of the day, it's about you, your family. And if you can sleep at night, you've done your job. So that is our approach, the candy shop approach that we call it follows up. With. We really take time to define that, write down that definition, and we hold our man to that definition. Remember this. Remember, this is the man that you want to be. 
We know what everybody else telling you need to be, but this is the man that you said you wanted to be. Uh, I know we're at the bottom of the hour, but we're going to go an extra 10 minutes. So uh, for those who are able to stick, stick with us, um, another, another listener asks um, or, or says that, that uh, he's unemployed at the very moment and, and, and feeling very clearly the, that extra weight as it relates to his masculinity. And he's wondering what you might suggest as tips for men in similar situations to sort of navigate these relationships with their wives and children while they feel such vulnerability. Yes, yeah, so, you know, I guess I give a, a stab, Gary, and I said over to you, right? Go for it. I, I think that's a cry for help. And I think it's important for us men to get connected to people in our lives that can help us. I also think that oftentimes our partners cannot be our therapists or our coaches, right? Our children can't be our therapists or our coaches. Who can be that person for us, right, that we can go to? Really getting centered with who we want to be and where we're headed. Because employment right now is hard for millions of people and owning that. Mm -hmm. But to be honest with you, you know, when it comes to obtaining quality employment, if you don't feel right emotionally or within, you're not going to be able to live up to what you want to be in that job. So we encourage doing both. Um, also, there's organizations out there that can support. Feel free to, and I can have a show to share my email address. We definitely can connect you to some of our partners wherever you're located or um, if Massachusetts, if, if you have any, but we pretty much have a national network and can definitely get you connected. And we know Ashoka that has an international network, so I know we don't mind getting you connected more tangibly. But for the most part, that's what I would recommend. Definitely revisiting what are you using to define the man you want to be and understand that and have that communicate conversation with your family, but also make sure that you reach out for help and take care of your mental and your physical because all of those things align. So that would be my recommendation. Nothing to add, Charles. I, I yeah, I appreciate that. And you know, I think we've heard similar challenges from from lots of men during COVID. Of you know, there's a there's a lot of involuntary job loss and a lot of resignations as well. Um, and you know, uh, men are we are so taught from early child on, you know, early early childhood on that um, we are because we work. We are providers first, and everything else is secondary. And I think a lot of helping all of us lean into, it matters as much how we care for others and our roles as caregivers, particularly in moments where, you know, we're out of work and we are feeling that piece of our identity and self-esteem missing. Um, but I absolutely appreciate Charles' comments on, um, you know, often our, our partner can't do it all. And certainly sometimes even, you know, we turn to our children for that. They can't do it for us either. Um, but being able to, you know, to ask for help um, and seek it, you know, whether it's that services or somebody else around you that you can talk to. It is so easy for us as men at this moment to stay in our online, um, you know, kind of socially distanced worlds and just the importance of reaching out for help. Yeah. And Gary, you've often talked about the, just how important it is to, to position this work, work around masculinity in, in, in with other social movements, right? To make sure that it's, that it's integrated in the movement for racial equity, for example, or the LGBTQ movement. Um, I'm curious, how, how, do, how do you go about including queer men in this work on healthy masculinity or, and people who identify as non-binary? Yeah, you know, I think what we try to do is find what's, the, what's our common cause in this, right? That harmful ideas about masculinity, that this thing we call patriarchy that puts more power on average in the hands of some men at the expense of women and men and others. And also, you know, that causes a deep rift in, in our own life as, as men um, to find our common cause in it. And, you know, one of, the, one of the casualties or one of the things that produces harmful masculinity is homophobia and transphobia. The amount of young people who experience, whether they define themselves as gay or bisexual or other or questioning or fluid, um, who experience homophobic bullying growing up, it's, it's off the charts. So how do we find our common cause in that, right? That these ideas about har harmful masculinity harm us all in far different ways. We don't want to make those, you know, simplistically say it's all the same, but to say we've all got a common cause and a healthier version of manhood out there. Um, and I think a lot of our work gets to the point of saying, you know, the definition of manhood is not really that important. It's what is my, what is my good humanity? Um, and how do I find that, you know, I've got more in common with somebody that I, that the world tries to tell me they're different than me. But in fact, if we look closely, 
we've got more in common um, than the than the world wants to say. Um, so it's about finding common cause. It's about centering our conversations with those who have most experienced the harms of patriarchy and racism and gender inequality. That means partnering with NGOs whose focus is on um, and, and are women led or are um, non-binary individual led um, or led by individuals of color so that we don't presume that somehow um, we know. And to affirm in those conversations that we're not arriving as, you know, if we do that in a global South context or if we do that in partnership with a community-based organization in DC that we're not saying, oh, here we are to help, um, to say that our liberation is, is tied up together. Um, we're here to try to figure it out, figure out jointly what we can do um, to break those systems of harm. Um, finding our common cause in doing that and finding also our different responsibilities um, in calling to account uh, harm that has been caused. Thank you. Um, one, one reader asks, um, as a woman and a feminist, um, a, a concern she has uh, with men uh, with good intentions that, that sometimes taking away spaces from women, for example, men talking about how to enhance gender equity. She's really appreciating this conversation because it, it focuses on what men can do for men uh, with, with a positive ripple effect for gender equity. But she's wondering where, where, how you find that balance and, and how you bring women into this and, and find that collaboration between men and women to advance healthier masculinity. Well, I know for us, we don't believe that the work could be done without women, right? To be honest with you, um, in our work with legislators, we sit on committees with them. We understand that to have quality conversation about what men's struggles are requires us to be open to understanding what women's struggles are, right? I think it's an equal exchange. I don't think we are um, in this field to just support one gender or one um, set of beliefs. I think we have openness to all beliefs, but I think it takes a collaborative teamwork. And I think you have to have people on your team on both ends with different views to really understand holistically, how can we make sure that masculinity serves its purpose for men, women, for people with various ways of identifying themselves from a gender perspective, masculinity, this conversation around masculinity and fatherhood is bigger than just one isolated gender. Right. I mean, this is about our families. This is about generations to come. This is about what our children need. Right. So I think we look at it from that worldly perspective. We don't really keep it in the box. And I think we also get caught up in semantics because semantics are very um, important, but also could put a drift in the work. So we try to keep the larger scale and purpose at the forefront of everything that we do through the type of people that we hire. We have women clinicians on our team from how we understand the work and talk about the work. Not only are we understanding what fathers experience, we're also understanding what women are experience, and we try to get embedded in the research. So we try to take a holistic approach. I'm not sure if I answered your question, but we try to be more holistic on all fronts. The the word that we try to keep, you know, kind of front and center, and with you know, it's it's in the top of our minds is is accountability. Um, and as we talk about this work. You know, what can we do to engage men and support them as fathers to also say, let's look at the fact that, you know, on average, women are doing more of the hands on care work. And that is a detriment to their careers, to their lives, and a lingering, ongoing inequality. How do we both, as a conversation, as male identified individuals in the room, say, I acknowledge that inequality and I've got to find ways I can be part of overcoming it? And at the same time, we can have a conversation that, that acknowledges that we need to call men in and support men in ways that gender norms and harmful masculinity also harm us as men. And we add the layer to that of racial inequality and other inequalities. And I think holding that, the word accountability there and putting it in practice, um, being okay with the uncomfortable conversations um, and provoking them sometimes in work that we will do with a given workplace is to you know, ask men in a questionnaire, how do you feel um, that you would be in terms of listening to a, to a woman who came to you with an issue of sexual harassment, et cetera. 80% of men will tell us, yeah, I know what to do. We'll ask women in the same setting, half the women would say men in their workplace know what to do. And we'll bring that into the room and say, so what is it, men? We think we're doing our part for gender equality. Women in this particular space aren't. Don't think mm -hmm. we are. How do we acknowledge? Um, and then we ask, so why don't men think they can do it? Typically they say, well, I'm worried what other men will say about me that to be seen as an ally in the space, I'm gonna get critiqued by other men. 
Um, so to bring those challenging conversations into the room, and I think to try to find a way that we get beyond uh, so much of our gender equality conversations have been with a zero sum game. Um, mm -hmm. And there are spaces where that's necessary. There's only so many seats at a board table. There's, on, there's only so many C-suite sp spaces there. There are moments where privilege and power have to be questioned by men, have to be questioned by white individuals compared to people of color in our country. But there's so much that's about coming up with a breaking beyond that and saying how we all win in a, in a gender equitable world, in a racial just world. Um, so I think, yeah, just to go back, the word to me is accountability and how do we live that? Gary, can I add this too? Because that's a great point. I would add also that we need to check our assumptions, right? And I want to say that too. Much of the people or groups of people that I speak to, particularly about the work that we do, we get a lot of pushback. And that the foundation of that pushback is this assumption that because we're helping fathers, we don't care about mothers, right? We get that a lot. So I think, you know, across the board, we need to really cancel those assumptions. You know, just because we're talking about fatherhood doesn't mean we don't care about mothers. Just because, just because we're talking about mothers doesn't mean that we don't care about fathers. There have to be room for people to really do the work on both sides and not be castigated because they're doing the work or questioned because they have a certain belief. And we get that pushback a lot. I can tell you the majority of the pushback that we get about our work is you're supporting fathers. Why not mothers? Mm -hmm. But we do help single mothers. But just because I'm supporting fathers doesn't mean that I don't care about mothers. I grew up in a household ran by a single mother. I understand the importance of mothers. I value my mother. She raised me. But at the end of the day, we got to make sure that we check our assumptions. It really puts a gap in the work and it prevents us from working with one another. Thank you both. Um, we've got a lot of other good questions that we're not going to have time to get to, including someone asking about any favorite children's books, uh, because ideas about gender roles start early. Uh, so if either of you have a good one, please drop it in, into the chat uh, or we can we can do a poll and, and, and share those later. So thank you again so much for, for joining us uh, both. This is a conversation that we could easily keep going, um, but I, I, I think there were a lot of a lot of good insights shared here and I'm, I'm glad that um, this has been a way to connect you two with each other. That's one of the lovely things about these conversations. It's often a, a chance for fellows to meet and understand each other's work. So in closing, I'll just invite everyone uh, to explore the, the links uh, in the chat and uh, of course, follow Gary and Charles and their work um, and tune into uh, future welcome changes uh, because there's just an endless stream of, of good ideas and, and amazing change makers that'll be coming uh, towards you. So thank you all everyone. Um, enjoy the rest of your weeks and we'll talk soon. Thanks for the invitation and Charles, great to know about your work. Um, Thank you, Gary. It's a pleasure meeting you. Likewise. Bye, everyone.